This 2024 US election is shaping up to be one of the closest presidential races ever. Well, the presidential race is deadlocked with just over a week left of voting. As election day approaches, polls are still showing about as tight of a race as it can get. Former Republican President Donald Trump and current Democratic Vice President Kamala Harris are crisscrossing the swing states ahead of election day on the 5th of November, hoping to sway undecided voters. We wanted to know what key issues and attitudes are shaping the way people vote and what they think about the two candidates. So in this week's episode, Naomi Shalit, politics editor for The Conversation in the US, has talked to a political scientist who's been surveying Americans on the issues that matter to them and their concerns as the election approaches. I'm Gemma Ware and this is The Conversation Weekly, the world explained by experts. Hi, Naomi. How are you? I'm doing fine, Gemma. A little weary of election coverage, but doing fine. Busy, busy time. So we appreciate you coming on the podcast. Now, you and I have worked a bit together a few times over the years. And one thing I know about you is that you hate, you really don't like political polls. Why is that? Well, actually, some of our best stories have been about polls. Public opinion polls are fine and useful. They help us understand America and what people here think, feel, and want. What I don't like, okay, maybe what I hate, are presidential polls, horse race polls in general. They're presented as news when they're not news. They ask a hypothetical and people say what they might do with respect to that hypothetical. And coverage of polls can shape an election, which is appalling. And the worst part, they've been massively wrong in the recent past and even before that. One of our headlines about the 2020 polling problems was election polls in 2020 produced error of unusual magnitude, expert panel finds, without pinpointing cause. Mm. They didn't even know after looking at it for ages why that happened. Okay, so I I see why you've got problems with those kind of who are you going to vote for kind of polls. But you do have time for other more nuanced surveys of Americans and the way they're feeling, don't you? Yes, we've worked with the good people at the University of Massachusetts Amherst polling operation for some time now. March of this year, they contacted us and asked if we were interested in a story about why Nikki Haley did so poorly in the Republican primaries. And we absolutely were. That first story looked at how, given her strengths and Donald Trump's vulnerabilities, Nikki Haley failed to seriously challenge Trump's dominant position in the GOP primaries. And the answer the scholar got in their polling? Sexism. Mm. Since then, they've done two other poll-based stories for us, one about the backlash to diversity, equity, and inclusion programs being rooted in racism, and the other about how U.S. voters say they're ready for a woman president, but sexist attitudes still go along with opposition to Harris. Mm. Some real themes coming through there. And I know you've also now been talking to one of the co-directors of the UMass Amherst poll, Jesse Rhodes, for us for this episode. Tell us a bit about Jesse. Jesse is a professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Much of his research looks at race and ethnicity in American politics, and that includes voting rights and the role of racial attitudes in informing Americans' views on presidential candidates or towards events like the January 6th insurrection. As I've mentioned, I've worked with Jesse and his colleagues over the past few months to understand what they're learning from their surveys of Americans in the lead up to this election. And I was excited when you came to us saying that they're doing another poll in these last few weeks before the vote. Um, You spoke to Jesse a couple of days ago to get some of the initial results of that field work. Before we hear that interview, though, can you tell us real quick how this kind of survey actually works? Yeah, I'm a layperson. I'm not a pollster. So this is how I understand how they do it. The UMass Amherst poll is a survey of 1,500 American adults conducted by the survey company YouGov. It's an online survey of a panel of people who are incentivized to answer the questions. They get points that can be cashed in with YouGov. And while there are only 1,500 people surveyed, the results are weighted to reflect how much a certain person's characteristics are representative of the U.S. national population. Okay. And in this round of the survey, what were they actually asking people? 
So this survey asked people about their perceptions of the candidates, their enthusiasm to vote, their expectations and concerns about the outcome. They also asked people about the way we vote and the electoral college system, which is the antiquated system in which presidents are not, in fact, elected directly by voters, but by state officials representing those voters. Thanks so much, Naomi. We're now going to hear that conversation you had with Jesse. Yes, I started by asking Jesse what he and his colleagues were hoping to learn from this survey and what their expectations were at the outset. Well, as you know, and as our survey confirmed, the 2024 presidential election is deadlocked and it's going to be a nail biter. It could very well be the closest presidential election in the last hundred years, if not in American history. And so what we wanted to understand was given that for many of us, the candidates are viewed as so different and so polarized in so many ways, why it is that the country itself is so evenly divided. And so we really dug in on this survey to understand how Americans perceived the candidates, what they thought the candidates' respective strengths and weaknesses were, and what was pushing them to prefer one of the candidates or the other. We also wanted to understand Americans' attitudes towards the really salient issues in the campaign, the national economy, immigration policy, reproductive rights, and so forth. And so we set out to learn a lot on this survey and really kind of go beyond the horse race to understand what was motivating people to likely turn out to vote in the way that they will. So what did you learn? And was there anything in the responses that actually surprised you? Well, I think we learned a lot about why the election is so close. I think many of us naively might be kind of flabbergasted that the election is so close, given that Donald Trump has been so extreme, you know, had had been involved in an insurrection against the federal government in 2020 and is making fairly authoritarian remarks during the campaign. It's the enemy from within, all the scum that we have to deal with that hate our country. That's a bigger enemy than China and Russia. And yet many Americans seem to be treating the election is a pretty normal election and one in which Americans perceive it as their their good their arguments for both sides, right? And we wanted to understand why that was. And so something that we're seeing and I think helps explain the tightness of this election cycle is just how important the economy is in Americans' perceptions and that they trust Donald Trump more on the economy than they do Kamala Harris. And so some really striking findings that we found is that Americans have very, very negative perceptions, both of the nation's economic situation and of their own circumstances. And super majorities perceive the economy as being fair or poor and their own economic situations as being fair or poor. Many Americans don't feel the economy is strong overall or helping them or their families. A number of polls have shown... 80 years ago, more than 90% of Americans were financially better off than their parents. Today, only 50% of Americans can say the same. And at the same time, they believe that Donald Trump is um, better suited to handle the economy and that he's a person who knows how to make the economy grow. And so in a situation where economic issues are so salient, and Donald Trump seems to have the upper hand on these issues, I think it does a lot to help explain why this election is so tight. Did you get those answers across parties? So no, there's a partisan divide, um, absolutely, that Democrats disproportionately view Harris as better across the board. Republicans disproportionately view Donald Trump as better across the board. But when we look at all respondents, attitudes break toward Trump. Not overwhelmingly. I, I don't want to overstate the degree to which Trump is favored over Harris on the economy, but I do think it's important in trying to frame this election and understand the closeness of election that the belief that Trump is somewhat better on the most salient issue is a definite advantage of his going into the final weeks of the campaign. So many people are mystified that, um, and includes a lot of people I know, they're mystified that in such a polarizing election and such a polarized electorate, some voters remain undecided. Did your survey help shed any light on 
on why, on what undecided voters care about or why they remain unsure, you know, two weeks before the election? So first, it's definitely the case that among individuals who are undecided, a fairly substantial share of those probably won't end up voting in any case, right? And so they're just some Americans who, either because they're not very engaged with politics or because they face a lot of barriers to voting, probably won't vote. But there are other Americans who express more substantive concerns. So roughly a quarter of those who said that they were unsure said that they don't like either candidate. And this is actually a fairly common lament. I should say that uh, among Americans who definitely are planning on voting, there are many who are not the most enthusiastic about the candidate that they plan on voting for, but they feel that it's the lesser of two evils. It's also important that among those who indicated that they were undecided about who to vote for, that they think they need to learn more about the candidates. And this might seem pretty wild to those of us who are very engaged in politics, who read the news daily, who are really interested in seeking out political information. But we need to keep in mind two things. One, many Americans are not motivated in the same way, or they may not have the benefit of the education and the training that makes learning about politics easier. And so we don't want to denigrate those people because there actually are decent reasons why people can find it challenging to learn a lot about candidates. The second thing that's important is that although many of us have been getting relentless emails and text messages and social media asking us to vote, asking for our money, asking us to do things for the campaigns, our survey found that about 40% of Americans have received no communications from either candidate. And so for that 40%, this campaign has largely passed them by, and it really helps explain why a non-trivial share of Americans perceive that they just don't have that much information about the candidates. With less than two weeks until Election Day, as many as half a million voters here in Pennsylvania remain undecided. So do you think the election is going to be decided by people who decide how to vote on their way to the polling place? I, I think that that's probably a little strong. I, I suspect that a lot is going to come down to turnout and enthusiasm. And I should say enthusiasm is very high. So we, we ask people about their enthusiasm about voting in this election. People are very enthusiastic among those who are planning on voting. They view it as a very high stakes election, which contributes to turnout. They view it as very important for democracy. They view it as important for the future of women. They view it as important for the future of the Supreme Court. And so I think what we really need to find out is who is getting their voters out. And it's going to be a nail biter. It's really going to come down to tens of thousands of votes in a small number of states. Long night, long week, possibly long month. I, I could very well be a long month. Yeah. And it looks like most Americans are worried about violence after the election. Is that specific to this year, perhaps because of what happened on January 6th? Or have you seen this fear in other years? Yeah. So obviously, January 6th is looming in the background. We have a breach of the Capitol. Breach of the Capitol. Breach of the Capitol. <laughs> Events in Washington have taken a violent and tumultuous turn in the past few hours as thousands of supporters of President Trump stormed the U.S. Capitol building, venting their anger at the victory of Joe Biden in the presidential election. That's a searing event for millions of Americans. I do think that it's important that it's also the case that political violence in this country at smaller scales has been on the upswing for the last half decade or more. And it is a reality that that is a context for our elections. And it's also important that in this campaign, you know, one of the candidates, Donald Trump, has already signaled that he might not accept the results of the election if he isn't the winner. Will you accept the results of the election, regardless of who wins? Yes or no, please. If it's a fair and legal and good election, absolutely. He's already casting doubt on the election results, presumably as a prelude to legal and political challenges to the results. They cheat. They cheated in the last election. 
and they're going to cheat in this election, but we're going to get them. And so the results showing that a very large majority of Americans are worried about the possibility of violence is borne out by our recent history. And it's not unreasonable by any means. You asked respondents to imagine that former President Trump or imagine that Kamala Harris wins the 2024 presidential election. And then you asked them to choose from a range of emotions, including fear, hope, happiness, relief, anger, disappointment, sadness, and pride. What was the dominant answer for each candidate if there was a dominant answer? It's kind of interesting when we ask about Trump and how people would feel if Trump won, uh, the dominant emotion would be disappointment at 40%, but followed very closely by fear at 39%. And so here, I think we're, we're seeing two things, right? So disappointment, that's a pretty common emotion if, if your preferred candidate doesn't win. But fear, I think, is very telling because it reflects, you know, the very real context in which we find ourselves that Donald Trump has threatened his political opponents. He's on record saying that he would use the power of the federal government, including the United States military, to punish his enemies. We have some sick people, radical left lunatics, and I think they're the and and it should be very easily handled by, if necessary, by National Guard, or if really necessary, by the military. And so it is a context in which, you know, I think a lot of Americans understandably have some anxiety about the prospects of his victory. Now, if Kamala Harris wins, the predominant emotion with 41% uh, is relief, which I think is revealing in its own way, um, first, that the plurality just wants to get out of this election in one piece, right? I think that they want a sense of normalcy. Now, on the other hand, that's not an um, overwhelming endorsement of enthusiasm for Harris, which I think is important, but it, it does suggest that a substantial fraction of Americans just want an outcome that continues some degree of, of reasonableness. Now, uh, another important emotion for Harris is hope. So 42% of Americans say hope, which I think is interesting. Now, to be fair, 37% of Americans indicate that they'd be hopeful if Trump wins. So I don't want to create the impression that there's not substantial positive emotions behind Trump. There is and we should be aware of it, but it's slightly higher in this case for Harris. Those people who said fear would be their response if Trump won, did you have an analogous response if Kamala Harris won? Yeah, so great question. We do. It, it is, it's somewhat more muted. So about a third, 33% of respondents say that they would experience fear if Harris wins. This is, I think, very much a reflection of our partisan politics. You know, Harris has not publicly uttered any explicitly threatening statements, but I do think that for a substantial fraction of Americans, the prospect of a victory by an African-American woman, what that represents symbolically. Also, Harris's policy proposals, which, although not particularly progressive, would continue the politics in many ways of Joe Biden and Barack Obama which you know, a substantial fraction of Americans view as threatening to our traditional um, ways of life in this country. So that's actually a good segue to my next question, which is, are you seeing what people are referring to as a gender gap in the way people see issues and plan to vote? Absolutely. There's a huge gender gap in perceptions of the candidates, plans for voting, and positions on a lot of the issues. And, you know, this reflects a context in which, obviously, we've got a Republican male candidate, a Democratic female candidate, and circumstances in which the Republican candidate has a history of sexist remarks, a history of credible allegations of um, sexual harassment and assault, as well as being civilly liable for sexual assault. Yes. In less than three hours, the jury found Donald Trump liable for sexually abusing E. Jean Carroll in a department store dressing room in the mid-1990s. And so in this context, we would expect there to be substantial differences between men and women, and there are. And so just to kind of give you a sense of some of those differences, just on who Americans tend to vote for by gender, Trump is currently holding 50 percent 
of the planned vote among men, but only 43% among women. To flip that, for Harris, only 44% of men say that they intend to vote for Harris, compared with 50% of women. It's almost a mirror image there, which, you know, it reflects a longstanding dynamic in our politics where women are more likely to vote for Democratic candidates, men are more likely to vote for Republican candidates. But I think that it's pretty substantial here. And, you know, th this also reflects a context in which reproductive rights and reproductive health issues are very salient. You don't have to agree that you want to or would advocate that you or a loved one would have an abortion to agree that the government should not be making that decision for any individual woman. We see this in particular with Donald Trump trying to come out as the father of IVF or portraying himself as the father of IVF. Oh, I want to talk about IVF. <laughs> I'm the father, you don't I'm hear the father that every day. of IVF. I'm the father of IVF, so I want to hear this question. Um, in large part because he correctly believes that Americans, but particularly women, view the Republican Party as very extreme on reproductive rights and reproductive health. Trump knows that these positions are unpopular. He's trying to signal that he's more moderate than the GOP. And, you know, uh, as, as not infrequently the case, making very strong statements in order to reposition himself. So I noticed some questions about um, about democracy, really, the confidence that people have in the election process in the U.S. It seemed that there was some real negativity around the Electoral College. So what did you learn? And was it specific to the Electoral College or, or were there more generalized feelings of concern about the election process? There's a lot of skepticism and frustration with the Electoral College. You know, obviously, there's awareness that twice in just the last few decades, the Electoral College vote has awarded the presidency to the candidate that did not receive the popular majority. Frankly, that is quite possible once again in um, 2024, where the candidate that loses the popular vote could indeed win the presidency. And the poll shows that Americans definitely prefer arrangements in which the national popular vote carries the day. Now, that being said, there are important divides in Americans' perceptions. There's a partisan divide. There are geographic divides, in part because, as our poll shows, people perceive that Americans living in urban areas are more likely to win out. If we move towards a popular vote, people in rural areas are perceived as being somewhat likely to lose if we move towards a national popular vote. And people perceive that Democrats are more likely to be benefiting if we move towards a popular vote, Republicans more likely to be not benefiting. And so unfortunately, because of the way that it maps onto our geographic politics and our partisan politics, it, it is really hard to imagine substantial change in the Electoral College, even though a majority would support such a change. I know how this 2024 election season has been for us at the conversation at the politics desk, uh, the endless coverage, it feels like. But what has this 2024 election season been like for you as a researcher into voting habits and the history of voting rights? Do you see parallels with other past elections? Are we in completely new territory? Or is history showing up here again in how people are thinking about these candidates and voting? I think that there are some unique features to the current election context. I mean, it's rare, if not unprecedented, that we have candidates calling each other fascist and authoritarian out loud, and that we have former advisors and other figures describing candidates as, as fascists and would-be dictators. It is clear from John Kelly's words that Donald Trump is someone who I quote, certainly falls into the general definition of fascist. This is communist, this is Marxist, this is fascist. But you know what? It's dangerous because she's saying that she's going to give away things that she'll never be able to get approved. It does happen um, very occasionally, but it's rare. In terms of the broader context, there are some kinds of parallels. You know, we find ourselves in a period of a lot of uncertainty, that there's a lot of structural economic inequality. There is a lot of very substantial demographic change 
there is um, pretty swift changes in our social norms around race and ethnicity, around gender, around sexual orientation. And there have been previous moments in American politics that have been contentious in many of those similar ways. So if we think back roughly 50, 60 years, the period around the civil rights movement and the period of like the late 1950s to the mid 1970s were also a period of great contention over the rights of people of color, the rights of women, the rights of sexual orientation and gender identity minorities. Similarly, in the late 19th and early 20th century, there was a huge amount of contestation over many of these same issues, right? So we saw the end of Reconstruction and the emergence of Jim Crow. On the other hand, we saw the granting of the right to vote to women as a group. And so in both of these periods, it was extremely contentious. And, and, and sometimes we kind of look back on these periods with rose-colored glasses, but we can't deny the reality that these were also periods of very heightened political polarization, of fairly substantial and widespread political violence, right? So we had a serious assassination attempt on Donald Trump in this election cycle. We are coming on the air with breaking news about former President Donald Trump, who is safe, according to his campaign, as the FBI says it is investigating what appears to be an attempted assassination. In 1968, we had an assassination of a presidential candidate, as well as the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., a, a very prominent political leader. Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. And so while it's, I think, understandable that we have a lot of anxiety and concern about our current circumstances, we do need to not take solace from, but just be aware of some parallels in our history where there's been similar levels of intense feelings, partisan polarization, violence, and controversy. So that's a, a really interesting point you're making, that you're seeing a lot of enthusiasm. You're saying we may have major turnout, that yes, there's polarization, but there's also intense engagement. And I guess the question that comes from that and out of what you just said now is, does that degree of engagement and enthusiasm worry you or are you optimistic because of it? I think naively, many of us Kind of long for the days in which our politics were more, quote unquote, reasonable or um, consensus based or moderate and so forth. And the truth is, we've had those politics in certain ways. If we think about the period from the late 1940s to the early 1960s, that was a relatively consensus period. It was also a period of low turnout, low political engagement, and it came at the price of not dealing with the nation's most searing problem, which was segregation, Jim Crow, and the systematic disenfranchisement of millions of our fellow Americans um, on the basis of race. And so we don't want to overly romanticize periods of consensus because historically, when we've had consensus, that has required ignoring, undermining, and suppressing some of the most important political and moral issues of our time. However, periods of deep engagement in our politics and high levels of turnout occur precisely because people are so invested in these very important political and moral issues. And so I guess my message would be is that we can't both have consensus and engagement at the same time. You have to pick one, and although we would like, in many ways, I think, to tamp down on some of the intensity, we don't want to ignore the fact that people are turning out and they're engaged in our politics because they're worried about their fundamental rights. They're, they're worried about the right to control their bodies or to be able to vote or to be able to express themselves as they're entitled to do under our Constitution. And so I think although we have reasons for concern, we don't want to be naive in seeking to go back to a more consensus period. Naomi, Jesse ended there by juxtaposing these eras of high political engagement versus eras of consensus. What do you think of that, having covered politics in the US for most of your career as a journalist? 
that periods of consensus in the American past have coincided with the suppression of rights, that's an important observation. Does that mean that the lack of consensus now represents a good thing? There's certainly a lot of participation in politics now, which of course is what keeps a democracy vital. Though I have to admit that this intensely political period we've been going through over this election, and really since Trump came on the scene in 2016, feels both exciting and also exhausting. The post pinned to the top of one of my social media accounts says, my last five years can be summed up in the image of me standing in front of the TV, watching CNN and asking, have we ever seen anything like this? I guess you might be doing that in the days to come um, because we are really just very close now to the vote. What will you be looking out for in the weeks that follow November 5th? Who wins the election? <laughs> And then, of course, how do the loser and their supporters react? Really, that question gets asked a lot by journalists. What to look for as X or Y happens? And my answer is usually people don't need instruction in that. They know what this election is about. Yes, they do. It's, it's high stakes. So thank you very much, Nomi, for coming on. Um, we're going to put a link in our show notes where our listeners can follow all the latest U.S. election coverage on the conversation. So good luck with the last leg of it. Thanks. That's it for this week's episode. It was written and produced by Katie Flood with assistance from Mend Marawani and sound design by Michelle Macklem. Our theme music is by Nita Saal. Stephen Kahn is our global executive editor and I'm Gemma Ware, the executive producer. You can connect with us on Instagram at theconversation.com or email us directly at podcast at theconversation.com. You can also sign up for The Conversation's free daily newsletter by clicking on the link in our show notes. The Conversation is a non-profit news outlet dedicated to sharing the work of academic experts with a wider audience. If you like what we do, please support us at donate.theconversation.com. That's donate.theconversation.com. And please rate and review the podcast wherever you follow us. Thanks for listening. <laughs>